Welcome to this study of battle tactics in Rule the Waves 2, part 1, being a bit cunning. I was going to call this an advanced guide, but I realised there's such a depth and breadth of knowledge amongst players of this game that I didn't want to set myself above anyone else, uh, particularly as my own uh, tactical nuances largely consists of going my ships, your ships, shooty shooty, twisty turny, maybe launch a torpedo or two. I, I never really stopped and paused and wondered about things until I looked at this series. And then I uncovered that there's something like 40 different things you can do or ways of thinking about your battle that will ideally help improve your performance. I've divided these up into 10 different types, so these um, slightly grey blobs. We're going to be considering being a bit cunning today, which is going to include firing your weapons a bit more shrewdly, trying to achieve some sort of level and surprise, and trying to use defensiveness to gain a tactical advantage. Part two, we'll look at ship manoeuvring. Part three, we'll look at fleet manoeuvring. And the last part, we'll consider some of the bigger uh, strategic uh, considerations. So let's crack on. Number one tactic, don't fire, hold your fire. It's something I've almost never done. Um, but thinking about the game and understanding gunnery, which is going to be the subject of another guide, has made me realize that I am wasting a huge amount of ammunition and if I've got a lot of ammunition, well, doesn't matter. But occasionally, it really, really does. I've listed out five reasons why you might be prudent about how many shells you're pumping out. Number one is if your chance of actually hitting anything is poor. So, if your final hit chance is less than one-ish, there's no hard and fast rule here, if your hit chance is less than one and you're hitting, hooray. Or if your final hit chance is less than a quarter of your base hit chance. So let me unpack this a little bit. So if you go into your ship details, you will see under your main guns, there's details of your guns and their penetration and how many rounds they've fired, so 78 here, <laughs> sorry, 98 here, so quite a lot. How many hits I've scored? One. Uh, my rate of fire. And down here is my hit chance, which currently is at 1.53. And if you hit this details, you'll bring up this little dialog box that will uh, tell you quite a lot. First of all, it tells me who I'm shooting at. Uh, a Wyoming class battleship, what the range is, so 6,100 yards, what my basic hit chance is, so 6.04. Then there's a set of modifiers that will improve or degrade my chances of hitting until I get to this final hit chance of 1.53. Without going into the whole details of gunnery, which I'm going to cover elsewhere, you'll notice that the crew quality is zero. The target aspect, what angle the target is, how broadside it is, uh, or how uh, beam on it is, is minus 10. So it's more beam. Uh, the current state of fire control is minus 10. The technology level, uh, this was taken from 1906, is minus 40. Thanks for that. Um, National accuracy, uh, this is from the British, is 10. Well, that's a nice bonus if you can get it. Um, ship turning, my ship turning, is minus 40, and target turning is minus 20. Some of these I can't control. I can't control the fire co control, I can't control the tech level, etc. But I can control ship turning. I discuss that later. I can control, I can't control target turning, but I can take it into consideration. And I can stop interfering with another ship's firing if I hold fire at this point. So have a look and decide whether it's worth still firing when your hit chance is getting under one. Number two, 
there are various factors that also impact your rate of fire. So here you'll see your rate of fire is 0 0.46. I'm not going to show the details of that, but if it's less than what it ought to be, again, you might think, well, what's the point at this moment? I'm not really firing on mass and effectively. If I only have a small number of guns firing, typically less than four, um, I may well wonder what's the point. There is a small salvo negative modifier for gunnery if you've only got a couple of guns firing. More tactically, if the time till darkness isn't very long and you want to carry on fighting the next day, maybe you've only got a couple of hours less and you only have you know low chances, you might want to save your ammo. And then finally, of course, if your ammunition is low, either because you've been shooting all day long or you've got one of those terrible legacy fleet uh, ships with a magazine of only 80 shells. So have a think about it. There are times when it's really advantageous to hold fire. Ditto for your torpedoes. Don't just loose off your torpedoes. Um, particularly, don't try and torpedo other destroyers. They're twisty, they're turny, they're shallow draft. They're an incredibly difficult target to hit, particularly with early period torpedoes. And chances are you're just going to waste. Number three, stop shooting at wounded targets. Use your torpedoes instead. If you see your enemy slow right down, but and particularly if your enemy has stopped, bring up a light cruiser, bring up at some destroyers and torpedo them. Here's some examples looking at post-battle analysis of what ha has happened to not even battleships. So here's an armoured cruiser. It started sinking at 11.22 and it sank 37 minutes later. And in that time, when it was already sinking, it's been hit 26 times by medium guns. I think they were 10 inch and 6 inch guns. And another 11 times by light guns and by two bombs and by nine torpedoes. Now, some of that would have wasted, you know, we would have continued torpedoing to make the damn thing sink. But certainly some of these, and these, these are the, just the shells that hit. Heaven knows how many shells were fired to get these hits. Ditto this light cruiser started sinking at five to five, sank 42 minutes later, 20 medium hits, 57 light hits and a torpedo. Even a destroyer started sinking at 5.09, sank 73 minutes later, the good old joys of progressive flooding, took another 12 light hits uh, along the way. You can't completely eliminate waste, but by using torpedoes, you're much more likely to bring the ship to a sudden end, this heroic armed cruiser notwithstanding. Tactic number four, engage the enemy from your other side. Don't just stay engaged on the side at which you started shooting. So here we started shooting on the starboard side and I would encourage you to swing around behind and start shooting on the port side to balance up your ammunition usage. This is obviously particularly useful for uh, early dreadnoughts with wing turrets but also if you are just uh, making full use of your secondary armament as well. It's also useful if shooting on the starboard side is being su uh, your sufferings from various negative gunnery modifiers such as glare, which is a light condition you get at sunrise and sunset, um, or if there are other ships fouling the range, or by smoke. So something to think about. Number five is the first of the surprise tactics, night fights. They're sudden death. I mean, everyone knows this. They're like knife fights. The person who strikes first is the person who usually sinks first. So the first big question about a night, uh, a night fight is, 
is it worth it? Um, especially if you don't have radar. Um, can you take the loss? There's the poor old Quincy, um, not doing so well at the Battle of Salvo Island, caught in the um, spotlight of the searchlights of the Japanese. If you do engage, try and stay out of enemy torpedo firing arcs. I know this is difficult because the enemy will appear very suddenly. And obviously, if you twist and turn to stay out of those firing arcs, you will probably rapidly decrease your own firing arcs and, of course, your gunnery accuracy. It's a tough gig. Um, you need to be lucky or have radar. Number six, the anti-carrier night dash raid. Now, I do like this. This is one I have done myself. It's born from the fact that um, carrier aircraft are a daytime weapon. They can launch at night and they can fly at night, but they can only attack during the daytime and they can only land without serious attrition uh, during the daylight. This means at night time or indeed at uh, low visibility, so bad weather, they are vulnerable. It's not for nothing that the very first carriers were equipped with heavy cruiser armament, 8-inch guns and such like, precisely because they needed to be able to fend off cruisers rushing in and attacking them, particularly in the 1920s when the range of aeroplanes wasn't great. When the range extends, when it gets to about 200 nautical miles for your aircraft range, you can still do this. You can start at dusk, rush through the night and be ready to hit them at dawn or if you're equipped with radar, find them at night. Uh, you know, 20 knots for 10 hours will take your force 200 miles, no problem. This might be a one-way mission, but it's ideal for uh, fast battleships, battle cruisers, particularly armoured cruisers. A good squadron of armored, nicely armoured cruisers, or sorry, heavy cruisers, I should probably say, uh, is an ideal sacrificial task force for this, rushing through the night to see if they can pounce on the carriers in the morning when they're undefended. Tactic number seven, the smokescreen torpedo trap. My hat goes off to you if you manage this one or have managed it in the past, and I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. Basically, with the enemy here coming towards your main fleet, you use your cruisers or destroyers to lay a smoke screen in front of the approaching enemy and then hide behind the smoke screen in the hope that the enemy will just blunder through uh, so that you can torpedo them at short range. Effectively, you're creating your own mini nighttime knife fight, but with smoke. Um, during the Second Battle of Sirt, uh, Admiral Vian uh, for the British used a pretty weak force of light cruisers and quite a large number of destroyers to lay down a whole ton of smoke, both to protect the convoy um, it was escorting from Admiral Ichano and uh, the fleet from uh, Reggia Marina, which had a battleship and a couple of heavy cruisers, as well as one or two light cruisers and destroyers. And um, by threatening torpedoes and smoke, they effectively created nighttime-ish conditions, which the Italians were perfectly sensibly cherry about just blundering through and seeing what was on the other side. So it has been used. Uh, I've not managed to do it myself. I would, I am going to try, but I would love to hear it if uh, you've managed to pull it off. Uh, number eight, of course, is just hiding. So this is the first of our defensive tactics, uh, hiding behind a smoke screen. Um, even though I see others, you know, Tortu Tortuga and the like, uh, using smoke screens quite often, I somehow managed to forget. Um, and it's, you know, easy to forget how thunderous these smoke screens can really be. Here's an example from, you know, First World War of US Navy destroyers protecting a convoy. 
I mean, smoke is a general problem. Uh, the Prince Regent Lilliput here is bombarding the Baltic Islands as part of the operation to capture them in uh, 1917. And just its funnel smoke and the broadside smoke is quite a lot of smoke. And if you've crisscrossed the same area in a battle, you will actually get a negative um, gunnery modifier for the level of smoke. But using it thoughtfully um, is a really, really helpful pattern memo to self <laughs> lay smoke screens next um both the enemy away with torpedoes the ai is very skittish at anything that looks like an oncoming torpedo attack so here's a situation in which the uh, armored cruiser of brooklyn was going toe to toe with two protected cruisers and doing pretty well so i got the british uh, destroyer squadron to turn in line abreast and charge start to charge towards the Brooklyn in what could easily have turned out to be a torpedo attack they'd have charged then they would turned and gone into line ahead and had a nice torpedo but the Brooklyn and the AI were having none of it as soon as they started and to see the turn off they went so if the pressure is getting too hot for you this is a really great way of just cooling the battle down number 10 is notice when you're being straddled it's up there in the uh, top left hand corner where you you are probably looking for hits those nice ones in bolds where you hit the enemy or the less nice ones where they hit you but those reports of shooting reports will also mention when you are, are straddled and if you are being straddled it's only a matter of time before you're going to be hit now that may be worth it because you may be straddling the enemy back and that's fine but if not then you should turn to spoil the enemy's fire and take the straddle off there are three levels of well four levels of gunnery one is not firing number two is ranging that's where uh, the rate of range change is so much that they're just having to fire some shots to get some spotting in to see what the range is like at all the most common one is deliberate fire when you've got the range but you aren't actually straddling the target so you probably haven't got the bearing and then finally straddling in which case as you can see here splash 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 boom hit um, you are bracketing the target with your hits now here i had a little look at how the uh, commerce was doing in its own shooting where it was targeting a b no it wasn't <laughs> That's a misidentification it was actually targeting the brooklyn that we saw earlier and there are various modifiers here that end up in a final hit chance of 0 0.58 see earlier discussion about whether to hold fire but regardless of that commerce's shooting at this moment isn't worth taking these further hits whilst it's straddled so turn and finally in this section tactic number 11 is be conscious of your torpedo zone i like other people will always fit torpedo tubes to capital ships or to all big ships in order so that i can see what the torpedo range is okay in the very late war you can just assume that the torpedo range is enormous um but certainly in the noughties and the teens and the twenties um, knowing how big the torpedo range is is really helpful about knowing when something is getting too close so for example here in this battle i have uh, the british battle line here and also around here i've got some destroyers and some destroyers and here's poor old arizona not having a good time of it um the 
part of the American battle line down here. But what's caught my eye is the Fanning class and the Terry class destroyers here. They are at the edge of my uh, torpedo range. And whilst they probably don't have a great firing solution at the edge, I definitely want to think about, do I need to turn away? Now, one thing you can do is pop into your almanac. I think it's actually called something like James, or it's called All the World's Fighting Ship, uh, actually in the battle um, control, but it's still the almanac and go and look up your enemy, so America in this case, and then you can scroll down and you will see what your intelligence has told you about your enemy's technology. Now, as it happens, for torpedo technology, uh, I don't know what they have. So the only guess that I've got is their technology is as good as mine. Either way, having clear view of what the torpedo range is will keep you safe-ish and is a good thing to keep in mind. So that's it for being shrewd. Just having a little bit more sense of what danger am I in, whether it's torpedoes or nighttime or going through smoke, and conserving your ammunition, your torpedoes, your gunfire, and seeking opportunities for surprise, whether it's nighttime dashes or suddenly appearing through the smoke uh, as part of a trap. In part two, I'm going to look at ship maneuvering. So join me for that. Thanks for watching and stay safe.